Uh, so welcome for this third and last session about uh, System Boot uh, of this morning. Um, so Michael Stapelberg uh, started contributing Debian in 2008. Um, last year, he ran a, uh, several months ago, he ran a, a survey on systemd and the general sentiment in the Debian community about systemd. And so today he's going to build, like, for, this, for the survey, more than 2,000 people actually answered, and he's going to build upon that to, uh, to, to present some, or to debunk some of the myths that we have about systemd. Uh, please welcome Michael. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, just in case I'm speaking too fast or anybody can't hear me, please just give a sign and I'll hope to correct that. Um, so my name is Michael Saperberg and um, while yesterday we had a talk by Leonard, uh, from the upstream point of view, this talk is gonna be more the downstream point of view. Um, in case you have any questions, please hold them until the end. We will have some time for questions and answers unless it's really, really important, in which case you can just ask it right away. Now, first of all, to cover a little bit of my backstory, I read Leonard's initial blog post a few days after it came out, and I was skeptical. I thought that's a huge undertaking, and I wasn't sure if that's actually going to work. So I decided I will just hold off for a year or so, and um, quite a while after Systemd was released, I actually first installed it and figured out, wow, this actually totally makes sense. Like, all the commands are so cool, we finally have a way to introspect our system, I can check the status of any system, I can reliably start and stop services, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and at that point, I figured this is the way forward, this is what we need, and I started contributing service files to packages um, to make them even better. Because systemd supports system5 services, but in order to get better uh, support, like more features and use the full spectrum of what systemd can offer, it's better to have native service files. So I started doing that, and some, ups, some maintainers in Debian actually merged these service files, um, but the overall progress was pretty slow, um, mostly due to a few issues that nobody in the package systemd team really had time to tackle. So uh, when I finally figured out how to approach the problem, I decided to join the package systemd team and just you know, work on fixing that. Um, that happened, I think, half a year to a year ago, and what I work by now in package systemd is bug reports also merging contributions, so if you send a patch for systemd, chances are that I will actually merge it into our packaging. Um, if it's patched to the actual systemd source code, I will forward it upstream. That has been working well in the past. I also care about DH systemd, which is a dev helper plugin to improve packaging, and in its system helpers, which is a thing I talked about yesterday. Um, I also sometimes do simple service files because they're just fun to do and uh, just a quick task and they improve the package. But I also tackle the more complex service files because I feel that they should really be done right. So I take my time and discuss with the maintainers and go back and forth. Um, and we try to do the complex service files so you don't necessarily have to. Um, also what's important for me is I say community outreach, I did the survey, I did um, several blog posts, I do talks at DevConf, obviously, and I hope to do some real life discussions. So in case you have any questions, um, feel free to grab me at any point during the conference. Now about the blog post, quick show of hands, who noticed that I did a few blog posts? Okay, a couple. Um, who of those read those end to end, like very carefully? Okay, perfect, great. Um, so the motivation of this talk is, as you might have noticed, we, as in the package systemd team, do not discuss on Debian Devil merely because we think it's not a good use of any of our time. Um, but we actually want to communicate with you. So I don't want to discuss the fact why Debian Devil is not well suited for that kind of communication. But um, I figured we should give a talk. And we want to address the top concerns, not only for the people who read the blog posts, but also for the people who prefer to just listen to me. Um, also, we want to encourage face-to-face -face discussion, so in case you don't have anything you want to discuss about before the talk, maybe you have something after the talk. Um, who of you did uh, notice the survey? Who of you participated in the survey? Okay, great. For the others, we had about 573 participants, of which 45.7% claimed to be DD or DM or some kind of maintainer of a Debian package. We also asked whether we should make it the default, but that was just you know, to have like, the opinion, not to actually make a decision. 43% said yes, 32% said no, and 23% uh, couldn't decide yet. 
Um, but what was most important about that survey was that we had free text fields for uh, people to voice their top concerns. So they could just enter anything and then I tried to you know, create buckets out of that and um, have the top concerns listed with a respective weight and then address them in this talk. So the agenda of this talk will be, first of all, these are actually the, the three top survey concerns we identified. The first of them is complexity. Um, this was voiced in many different ways and it has many different you know, things to consider. Some people said that systemd has too many dependencies or it's too complex or it does too many things, it has too many features, it's hard to understand, all that kind of stuff is what I'm trying to address here. Then there's the issue of portability. Um, many of you might know that systemd only runs on Linux. That's what's going to be in the second part and uh, the third part deals with debugging. Um, in case any of you have any questions that are not, or any concerns that are not uh, within these three major topics, we have some time to answer them at the end. Now, before we start, a few quick clarifications because they also came up in the survey. The systemd config files are not binary, they're human readable ASCII text files, that's just a fact. Also, you can install systemd alongside sysv in it, so on each and every one of your machines, you can just install it, try it out. If you don't like it, switch back or switch back and forth if you have any particular problem. Also, systemd has plenty of documentation. It might be hard um, to you know, understand all of it because it's just so much documentation, but it's much better to have so much documentation than none at all, right? Um, so those I just wanted to get out of the way and now let's start with the complexity. Um, first of all, people mentioned that systemd has so many dependencies. Now, I wasn't actually sure how to address that and uh, I decided that, hey, I don't actually know each and every dependency of systemd, but probably I should in answer to answer that. Um, so I made a list of all the dependencies and you can read that document online. Um, the slides will be uploaded later on. Um, it's also in my blog. And in that document, I um, carefully document all the dependencies of PID1, which are like 10, um, and then we have um, like about 40 other binaries that are somewhat related to systemd. Some of them are just very simple uh, command line wrappers that you can use in your shell script. Uh, some of them are actually uh, demons that are started on demand, um, like the whole uh, time date CTL stuff and hostname CTL stuff, stuff like that. Um, so in case you're interested in that and you want to arrive at your own opinion on whether a systemd has too many dependencies or just the right amount of justified dependencies, please read the document and then you know, have your own opinion. Um, many people talk to me about Dbus and how they don't like Dbus and they don't want Dbus to be running within their init system. Um, and I feel that it's worth clarifying that um, what systemd actually uses is the Dbus wire format. So it uses uh, Dbus for serialization in the first place in order to not invent its own IPC mechanism because by now we actually have enough of them, right? There's no point in just inventing another one of them and going through all the problems again. So the systemctl command which you use to, you know, uh, introspect your system, et cetera, and you know, start it and debug it. It actually, when you run it as root, uh, will communicate with systemd through a private Unix socket. It's not uh, required to have a Dbus daemon running. Of course, if you want to use it on a typical desktop system and use the GNOME tools to see your uh, service hierarchy and all that stuff, that goes over the regular uh, system Dbus bus. All right, um, most of the other libraries that systemd actually uses are widely used libraries like I already mentioned Dbus, there's SE Linux, there's libcap, all that kind of stuff. Um, and those libraries are mostly memory mapped anyway. You could say, well, not on an embedded system, yeah, I give you that, but on most of your machines, it's gonna be memory mapped anyway. Most of them are actually installed already, so if you actually will type apt-get install systemd, even though you're not actually gonna install it, you will see that it only pulls in like five packages or so. All right, um, the next argument was that systemd is so bloated. Now, bloat is hard to define, but Wikipedia gives a definition and I try to follow that. Um, Wikipedia says that uh, bloated programs are often uh, using more resources like more memory, more CPU, they are um, bigger in terms of lines of code, they're perceived as slower, um, they have higher maintenance costs, all that stuff. Um, to that we say that yes, obviously systemd uses more memory, you can actually measure that, but it's worth it because it does a lot more stuff. It doesn't just you know, run your service in the background and then hope that it will all magically just work out. It actually keeps track of it and if it dies, it can restart it. If it dies, it will show you what's the exit code, when did it actually die, what are the log lines that it produced, all that stuff and that obviously requires more resources. I think that's very clear. Um, also, 
The second point of, of bloat as per the Wikipedia definition is that bloated software is slower, but it turns out that systemd is actually measurably faster than sysv in it. Um, so that clearly doesn't apply, right? Um, also, there is the factor about maintenance cost, and we think that there will be actually less maintenance cost eventually. And what do we mean by that? Um, currently, we have the model where we have a relatively simple uh, system 5 in it, and then we have a lot of complexity over all the init scripts. And a lot of maintainers need to you know, learn about what should go into an init script and how to implement all these features. Like, uh, I have recently looked at a couple of init scripts, and many, many of them have this idiom where they will try to shut down um, the service cleanly and if that doesn't work they fall back on killing it and if that doesn't work they fall back on killing it really really hard and each and every one of them has like a slightly different implementation of that with slightly different timeouts and all that stuff and that's a pattern you see in all the init scripts I mean just look at them and uh, with systemd yes obviously that complexity will not go away it will just go into a different place but it will go into one repository where there's one upstream and we can all fix that stuff there and then, you know, over all the distributions, we can actually benefit from Arch Linux people contributing their fixes, from Gentoo people contributing their fixes, from the Fedora people, etc. And we will have one solution that, you know, has some complexity, but in turn, all of you, all the package maintainers, don't actually need to deal with all that complexity anymore. So I think that's a great benefit. Um, some people were saying that systemd is too complex, right? Um, I just try to, to explain why I think that the complexity is actually centralized and not added because it's just pulled into a different place. Um, let me just add that many features of systemd are optional. Um, as an example, I'm not actually using all the features of systemd. I'm not actually running GNOME. Um, so, you know, I use what I like. I like the journal. I like systemd itself. Um, all the other stuff is not that important to me. Um, and also, new things always seem complex at first. So whichever init system it's going to be that we switch to, it will seem complex just because it's new, right? Many of you have grown up with System 5 and me included, and we think that we know how it works because we're used to it and it seems to kind of work, but I actually looked at the source code recently and at all the init scripts and stuff, and it's much, much more complex than I thought, and I think many of you might be in the same situation that, you know, you just think, yeah, it's this simple thing, but it turns out it's actually not. Um, and if you compare that, if you honestly really compare it, I think systemd doesn't look too bad. Now, the second part is that systemd is not portable. And obviously, that's a fact, right? Uh, we can't have any opinion about that. It's just a fact. Um, systemd is a Linux-specific init system, and it does not run on uh, Debian slash KFreeBSD or Debian slash Herd, which we have. Now, that is not an arbitrary decision, as Leonard tried to explain in his talk yesterday. Um, we actually need C groups for systemd to achieve all the, the, the things that it does. And also, one important factor is that if we try to make it portable and, for example, had a KFreeBSD implementation of systemd that would not use C groups, we would need a lot of code and it would be, you know, the, the test matrix of just um, changing one little thing in systemd, you would have to. Uh, experiment and try it out on all the different platforms and write compatibility code for non-C group stuff, it would just blow up, right? It would be so much more complicated to contribute anything to systemd, to just change it, um, that it's just a decision that upstream made that they are not going to do that. Um, now, I say not portable is actually not a problem because we can use systemd on Linux and system 5 in it elsewhere or something else elsewhere. You know, if there is a better in system coming up, uh, for the KFreeBSD people, they can adopt that. Um, in the midterm, obviously, there is some increased maintenance effort because we need to have a time period where there's system 5 init scripts and systemd service files. Um, and, you know, we, we just can't get around that, right? B because whatever we end up switching to, we need to have that time period. So there's no way to get around that. Um, but the long-term situation, I imagine personally, will be like non-Linux bugs today. So for example, let's be honest, I don't test my software that I maintain in Debian on KFreeBSD or Herd at all. I rely on people who actually use it on these platforms to send me bug reports and then I will gladly uh, merge the patches they provide or look into the problem if they can't figure it out. Um, but it's handled best effort, right? If there is, say, 10 bug reports that have Linux-specific problems, I will handle those before I look at the first KFreeBSD problem. It's just not a priority. And I think that this is the only viable and realistic and pragmatic model that we can have for KFreeBSD maintenance at large. 
So I say that's not a problem. Also, I say that kernels are different, and that's a good thing, because the Linux kernel provides C groups and all these nice features, which the other kernels don't provide. But then again, the other kernels provide nice features. So for example, if I were to install a KFreeBSD box, I could probably use CFS. Now, I could also use that on Linux, but that would be more complicated and stuff. Um, there's uh, a feature that I can't have on Linux, which is PF, like the packet filter on KFreeBSD. Um, and you know, the, the different uh, kernels and the different distributions that we offer, they are different, and that's good. We should keep that diversity. Now, why not make Debian a good Linux distribution and a good KFreeBSD and her distribution? This does not include that we need to use the same init system on all of them. Um, also, there's an asterisk um, behind that point because I only care about the good Linux part, to be honest. I leave it up to the others who are passionate in the KFreeBSD and third part to make it good there, right? So, debugging. Um, debugging is kind of a, an interesting issue because I think that many people are so used to running init scripts with sh-x and see what it actually does and where it goes wrong. Um, and that's just an issue that you won't have to do with systemd. It's not that you cannot do it, it's you won't have to because all the issues that you would typically debug with sh-x, systemctl status will actually tell you. You can actually see what command systemd tried to start to bring up the daemon. You will see the, the exit code with which they exited. Um, you can see the log output of the daemons. You don't need to s trace a daemon because it you know, logs into a weird file that's not set up properly and you can't catch the standard error. That's just all things that will not happen in systemd. Now, in case you actually need to debug something that is you know, in early boot or somewhere where systemctl status won't help, you can always boot with the kernel parameter systemd.log level equals debug on your kernel command line, and it will increase the debug log level and just log all the stuff. Um, interestingly, as was mentioned in two talks already, the journal will include log messages from the early boot. So you will actually get a much better picture of what is happening. Um, and all the stuff that is happening in systemd has timeouts, which are, as far as I know, uh, 90 seconds, and afterwards you will just get a rescue shell, right? So in case there is really something that's really, really stuck, like a device not appearing, but it needs to appear like your root file system is not there because you made a mistake in configuration, you will get a rescue shell and can try to fix it and then you know, boot into your system and actually fix it properly. Um, some people were under the impression that in systemd everything is implemented in C, so you would need to debug the C source code, and that's complicated, more complicated than shell. I don't necessarily agree, but looking at the C code is, I wrote rarely required. I would actually say it's never required, but I didn't want to put it on the slides um, because that's you know uh, too hard a statement. I have in the entire history of debugging boot problems with systemd, I think looked at the source code once. Um, and I can't imagine that for any of you it's going to be required. So that's not a concern. Also, what's interesting is that you can, uh, if you have some race conditions in your boot, um, or you're not quite aware of the order in which things are happening and you want to have a tight grasp on that, you can boot with systemd.confirm underscore spawn equals one, and you can say yes or no to each and every service when it starts, um, and that might help you out with your specific problem. Also, in um, Newer versions, um, actually in uh, 204 only, which is currently in Debian Experimental, there is uh, a thing called debug shell, which you can enable, and then you can switch to a debug shell uh, very early in the early boot. Um, some people were afraid of cycles, like you have all these dependencies, and there might be a dependency cycle in there, and then your system might be broken. But that doesn't happen, because uh, cycles are broken automatically by systemd. Um, so whenever there's a cycle, it gets resolved in some way, which might obviously not be the best way. It might not actually solve the problem, but at least it will boot, and then you can actually fix the problem. Also, if all else fails, you can just uh, boot with systemd.unit equals rescue.target, and um, all these tips and tricks I just gave are also presented in a nice fashion on the free desktop wiki um, on the link I give here. Um, so there's really a lot of documentation available on how to debug all these issues, and you know, I'm, I'm confident that debugging is just as easy, if not easier, than with the current init system we have. 
Now, I have one more slide that I just want to get out there, um, why we would need to switch to systemd, because that wasn't clear to some people in the survey, but it's not a top concern. So let's just go over that quickly, and then we can ask, uh, answer your questions. Um, systemd provides a reliable and clean service management. So it actually has a defined environment. It does not leak your stuff that you use as an administrator in your shell into the services. Um, we can finally introspect all the services, we can look at the status, we can you know, clearly stop them, all that kind of stuff. We have beautifully simple service files which are the equivalent of an init script. Just look at a few of them and you will see that they're really simple to understand for each and every one of you. Um, that will make maintenance costs a lot less in the future. Um, it has better hot plug, uh, think of laptops especially. Um, but uh, in my case, I also use systemd on a Raspberry Pi. I use it on all my servers, on all my virtual machines. It works beautifully everywhere. Um, and last but not least, we will eventually arrive at a unified init system across the Linux distros, or at least across the most important ones. So that actually lowers the barrier for new people to Debian, because you know some people might consider switching from their current distribution, but then they say, oh, it's all different. It uses this old init system. I don't know how to deal with that. You know, Think of all the people that will actually grow up with systemd. There's already people I talk to that only know systemd. All right, so that's the slides part of my talk. Um, as always, please talk to us if you have any questions. There's an IRC channel, there's a mailing list, there's my blog that you should follow if that kind of thing interests you. And now I'll be happy to answer your questions. Question. Well, uh, I, I think you, you, you should explain uh, why uh, we, we should um, adopt systemd as a default, why we can't keep uh, the current situation where we have six, uh, six five units by default on systemd as an alternative. What's right. the problem so, with that? So as far as I understood it, the question is why would, you sh why would we should, why we should make it the default and not just have both of them supported? And the answer is pretty obvious because maintenance of two different init systems is kind of complicated and we can accept that in the short term, but we will not accept that in the long term. Uh, many people have actually been asking me when can we finally make some decision in that area just because you know, we want to have one init system that we can concentrate and focus on um, and not multiple init systems that are kind of supported and living there at the same time. Yes, but you've already suggested that if we're going to continue to support non-Linux kernels, that the way you suggest we do that is by supporting more than one init system. So for the right. average maintainer of a package in Debian, it will never be the case that systemd is the only thing that they're able to support unless systemd chooses to also support the other kernels. So it seems to me that you're just moving you know, this burden of responsibility away and you know, leaving it in the hands of every package maintainer in Debian to have to deal with multiple init systems instead of you know, dealing with this somehow closer to the maintenance of the init systems themselves. I don't know if that's necessarily, you know, a good choice or a bad choice, but you are clearly making a conscious decision to shift a burden of work which will never go away. Yes, um, so that's a hard problem and question to answer. Um, I don't have a silver bullet for that. There have been approaches of uh, having a converter that would convert very simple service files into equivalent init scripts. I have seen um, that work and I don't think it's gonna work unless somebody really spends a lot of time on that. Um, it was a summer of code project that is not in a viable state at all. Um, I do agree that, you know, some, so some people were mentioning that um, we still have KFreeBSD and we still need to keep D in its scripts around. Um, but they will not be as important anymore as they are before because our major, our most important platform, which is Linux, uh, is running on systemd. So the issues that are more pressing now will become less of an issue later. Um, you know, I, I, I totally agree. I don't, I can't make it all go away, um, but I think that's a good compromise to have. Um, you know, that's all I can say, sorry. More questions over here. Somebody in the room? Mic is off. Back up. All right, you. Hello? Yeah. 
Is somebody in this room using K3BSD in production, really, for something serious? Anyone? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so if you actually look at the popularity contest numbers and I realize that they are skewed and, you know, opt-in and all that stuff, you will see that there is about 70 installations of the K3BSD kernel, whereas there are about 100,000 installations of the Linux kernel. You know, just to give you some perspective, I'm not saying that's the actual usage numbers. Question over here. Yeah, so um, what, is the, what is the status of systemd package and all the dependencies in, in Wheezy and, and Jesse? Is it in any sort of usable state right now? Okay, um, so the state in Wheezy, um, which is our latest stable release, is pretty good. Um, I would say you can use systemd there. The version in there is 44, which is quite old by now, um, but that's expected kind of of a stable release. Um, we have the, uh, a much more recent version, which is version 204. There's, there was a huge gap because of the UDF merge. Um, we have version 204 in Debian Experimental, and that is mostly because it was um, a big change because you know, the UDF uh, package was maintained separately, and now it's not anymore. It's team maintained by now. Um, so we have that in Experimental. We need to get a transition slot for libudev uh, 0 to libudev 1 before we can upload it to Unstable. Um, that request is already filed, but there has not been any response so far, um, but as soon as that happens, and I'm fairly confident that from our side it can happen pretty quickly, we will have systemd204 in a reasonable shape, and of course all the dependencies and everything that you need um, to run it. As I already mentioned, I'm running systemd for over a year in production on all my machines. Um, so it's certainly usable in Debian. Does that answer your question? All right. So you said you looked at the dependency set and you've made a list which um, we don't have here but we can go and have a look and it wasn't excessive, it was bigger but that's probably fair enough. Um, but um, my understanding, did you look at the build dependency list? Because I know the f recent Fedora ARM64 bootstrap uh, complained a lot about 400 build dependencies which is a problem for those of us that do bootstrapping. Now I realize that's a relatively minority interest but it mm -hmm. is another problem. Um, Bootstrapping is already very painful and if you can't get an init system until you've built 400 packages that's kind of annoying. Um, so, But I don't know how bad the problem is with Upstart to be fair, uh, yeah. so we should look at both of those. Yes. But it's, it's, it's something I'd like to know the answers to and I haven't looked in detail but yes. I did get a lot of complaining from Mr. Masters. Okay, um, I have not looked in detail uh, at the build dependencies. Um, for my personal builds and pbuilder it looks like a reasonable set of dependencies that are pulled in. Um, you know, if there is any concern about that, um, I'm sure Upstream would be happy to help you out with that. In fact, Leonard wants to say something. Um, uh, so it's, it's the usual stuff, autoconf and automake and all these things, which shouldn't be a problem. The problem that they probably were complaining about was um, we build all our man, man page with docbook, and that pulls in all the XSL L style sheets and things like that. But that's actually optional. It's, it's just that the RPM always builds it with it. So, and uh, yeah. Yeah, so just to clarify, I guess actually the problem's much worse in Fedora because there's no cross-building and there's no bootstrap minimal building mechanism yet. So, and we do have both of those things sort of nearly finished in Debian, so um, that probably makes most of it go away. And uh, uh, how hard is for someone to try it out? Le le let's say I want to take a look at the thing. As, as you say, you are using for a year in production. What if I want to try it out? Is it possible for me to install it and maybe just replace the kernel in it? Yes, uh, in, in fact, that's just how you do it. So if you want to try it out, if anybody wants to try it out, you just up get install systemd, um, ideally from experimental. Um, it's not as bad as it sounds. Um, and then you will just modify your kernel command line to um, include init equals slash bin slash systemd and you will boot up in systemd. And if you decide you don't want to boot up in systemd anymore, just you know, remove that from your kernel command line. You can obviously do that with the edit function in grub on a boot per boot basis. So it's really, really simple to try it out. 
So can I just comment on that for our experience? So I've been trying both Upstart and SystemD on my laptop recently. So the path of least resistance is just that you just install SystemD and you don't even change the default line of the kernel. Yes. You just boot and in your grab or whatever, you just edit the command line of the kernel and you add, add in it equal, equal slash bin slash SystemD. Yes. And if you forget about it, the next step boot you will get back onto System 5. So that's really easy to try out and not, let's, let's say, not scary at all. Yes, you will just notice that your next boot will be much slower and then you think, oh, yeah, I need to add that flag. <laughs> okay, more questions. One more over here. Um, in fa I, I think that uh, not having systemd as default has some drawbacks um, in the bugs affecting systemd. For example, uh, if you are using LVM2 on a crypt disk, uh, you need, a, I, I didn't try it, maybe it's fixed in the package in experimental, but the one in unstable, you, uh, you cannot boot the VT setup, but it is because uh, the integration of systemd in Debian is not complete. We are still using a lot of init script, and the LVM2 is set up by uh, the Debian init script. Uh, yeah. The, uh, so the, crypt, uh, disk, uh, the crypt setup is being worked, I see in the mailing list, but it's... Uh, it's problematic to, to not having uh, more people working on system day because uh, we, we don't use it as a default. Yes, yeah, so the, the LVM issue that you're speaking of is a bit of a pain point. I've been trying to debug this um, in the last couple of days and I'm working with somebody who actually can uh, fairly regularly reproduce that problem actually because in, oh, you, you can? Okay, great, so maybe we can have a look together and fix it um, because I couldn't reproduce it um, up until now. Um, but I'm also using crypto, and I have a few machines where I have LVM. So in general, this works. It's just very specific setups that don't work. More questions? Okay, so uh, I'm relaying a question from, from IRC. So the question is that uh, instead of breaking dependency loops during boot, can it be made to reject to install such dependency loops when installing an upgrading package like system VRC is doing? Um, Upstream wants to answer that. Out there, microphone, maybe? Okay. Oh. Oh, yeah. oh, now it works. Um, uh, so that's actually um, uh, pretty difficult because um, we only check for dependencies between the stuff you actually start, right? We don't really care if the entire network of, 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 of dependencies you could theoretically have has any loops or cycles. Uh, we only care about the transactions that are actually started. And those, of course, we only know at boot time when we know which devices have shown up what you actually wanted to boot into. So um, it's, a, it's a feature of systemd that you can have as many cycles as you want as long as you don't have them in the, the stuff you actually try to execute. All right, more questions? Yes. Okay, so... This is probably not even for you, but it's a, uh, something that I'm asking myself. Uh, clearly, uh, either systemd or upstart is a, is a better thing than systemd. So, but it's not clear to me who is the one who can make that decision on a technical standpoint. So usually, in Debian, the maintainer take, makes a decision, and probably I'm asking this too early, so, but uh, in this case, I don't think there's anything in DI that hard codes System V in it is just essential yes in the package. Maybe I'm wrong and I would like to someone to correct me. So in this case, I, it's not clear to me how we are going to make that decision. And uh, for, for, for myself, I'm, I don't really care much about boot systems. And I think most of the people that get involved in the flame yours don't, can't, can't also uh, make an informed decision about that. And yeah. I would like to, to, to see how we are going to take the decision if if the system D and the upstart maintainers go to reach a conclusion or something else. <laughs> so I think it's unlikely that um, the two maintainer teams will reach a conclusion. Um, but um, I actually I'm just uh, going to work on how we can technically um, make that decision in the next few days and then you know I can just propose it and we'll see what happens. If somebody else wants to answer that, please go ahead. Okay. Well, I can try to... Well. I think that what we are still lacking, uh, lacking is a detailed plan of what it means to make it the default. I mean, what in terms of uh, what other packages need changes, if any. Uh, then, 
um, probably the, well, the way we, well, <laughs> okay, I, should have, I shouldn't have tried to answer that. <laughs> Sorry. No, but what, it, what will likely happen is that um, it, will, it will go to a technical, to com technical committee at some point, that's really likely, because it will, I would be quite surprised if we cannot find one developer who will bring it to the technical committee, and it just take, takes one, so. <laughs> Or, or the DPL, yeah. So the question is, uh, when, when, when is the best time to bring it to the technical com committee? So I don't have a clear answer on that. So maybe Bidale wants to answer? <laughs> we actually talked about this a little bit in the tech committee buff the day before yesterday, I guess it was, and I think you're the one who asked the question about, you know, what, what do we actually need to do to bring it to that point? Yes. And I think the advice you were given was probably very good, which is to go look at the Thing that we're currently discussing around LIMP-JPEG because what it really comes down to is for the committee to be able to make a decision, we have to understand what the implications are for the rest of the work that happens in the distribution. And that largely comes down to what are the set of diffs that we're arguing about? What packages need to be changed or updated? What implications does this have for the installer system and things like that? And so when Lucas says, you know, we, we sort of lack the, the plan for you know yes. what steps would be required to go from where we are now to the change that you'd like to see, that's what has to get articulated. And once that's articulated, then we have a concrete thing that we're discussing and we're saying, is this good, is this bad, are there problems, are there still questions that need to be answered? And that's something I'm confident that you know the distribution as a whole and certainly the subset of us that sit on the technical committee can wrestle with and try to make a good decision on. But the problem right now is that it's all still sort of in the, oh, this is great, oh, this is great, we ought to do this, no, we ought to do that. Right. And it's not in the form of, you know, sort of, do we pick this set of diffs or that set of diffs to carry forward with the distribution? Yes. And that's the kind of thing that would make this a crisper decision for us to try and wrap our brains around. I, I will. I will just state up front that I personally have. You know, um, uh, I, I believe that the problem is that if the distribution decides to go forward with System D as a default, that the attitude that you're currently putting forward about, you know, obviously we make Linux first and everything else a second-class citizen is something that many within Debian will have a very difficult time swallowing philosophically, even if we all look at the numbers and go, yeah, I mean, from a practical standpoint, that's right. Um, there is a big difference between sort of understanding and acknowledging that one of our kernels has the vast majority of the, the user base and the difference between that and the sort of philosophical notion that we're trying to be supportive of you know, alternatives. And I think that the reason this is going to end up being such an incredibly difficult decision for the distribution to wrestle with is because what you would like to think of as being a simple technical choice is going to end up being a hugely philosophical decision about the extent to which we continue to try and treat other kernels as first class citizens. So related to that, I wonder, uh, last year in, G -Summer, in the Google Summer of Code, someone tried out generating like a system file script from the systemd uh, service files. So I know the project didn't go that well, but is the idea still viable, or did you find any in inherent limitation that makes the idea not viable? So the problem as I see it is that in order to have support for the features that you can express in a systemd service file, you would essentially need to re-implement large parts of systemd. And that's not a good idea, right? Um, don't you have maybe an 80-20 rule or something? Don't you have maybe an 80-20 rule or something to figure out what's easily implementable and what's not? Um, uh, so we have around a thousand init scripts in Debian currently, and I haven't looked at the majority of those even. I have looked at the ones that have the highest popcorn and that I use personally and that I think are important, and those will not benefit from such a generator at all. Okay, more questions? So I guess this is it. Uh, thanks, Michael. Thank you very much. Uh,